The 1950s 60s sex comedies often pit male and female leads against each other in a fight for sexual agency and dominance. The quarreling duo typically hates each other at first sight, but in order to bed the woman, the man will pretend he is courteous, reserved, and at times even impotent to disguise his intentions. He adopts an alternate, often effeminate persona that conceals his hyper-masculine personality, but his true, sleazy, indecent nature is physically manifested in his bachelor pad, a suggestive space where music swells, lights dims, and couches convert into pull-out beds, all at the flick of a switch. The female protagonists, in turn, embrace their sexual appeal and act as independent agents with a stronghold on their own lives and futures. Some find that this reversion of gender roles blurs preconceived notions of masculinity and femininity as the man assumes a more passive character and the woman a more active one. But a closer examination of Michael Gordon's Pillow Talk reveals that sex comedies actually uphold patriarchal characterizations through mise-en-scene and camera work. The basic plotline boils down to a battle of the sexes, a battle of wit and trickery. Chronicling the relationship between Brad Allen and Jan Morrow, the film seems to depict Jan as a mature, classy woman who is more similar to Brad than expected. Sharp-tongued, successful, job-oriented, and well-dressed, she seems to push against traditional portrayals of females as weak, compliant, and even incapable. As progressive as this portrayal may seem, the film actually goes to great lengths to define Jan and Brad by their gender. Jan as an enticing sexual object to satisfy the male gaze, and Brad as a masterful manipulator in their relationship. The male gaze, a term coined in 1975 by film critic Laura Mulvey, deems that the ca camera, and thus viewers, take on a masculine heterosexual perspective that casts a sexual voyeuristic gaze upon actresses. The viewers first see this demonstrated in the introduction of Jan Morrow. The frame catches her bare legs in a close-up shot and slowly pans upwards. In ogling the slender legs, the audience fetishizes her body and instantly associates a sense of sensuality and femininity to her character. She must be sexualized in order for romance to exist, since sex comedies function on the basis of gender differences. In this era of romance, women seem to merely move from the kitchen to the bedroom. They are still bound to domesticity. The title sequence in the same way emphasizes a need to pit femininity and masculinity for the sake of erotic suspense. The panel room divider biparts the image, separating two individuals who are clearly a man and woman. There is no face reveal, but nightgown clad bare legs on the right pose a striking visual incongruity to the larger pajama clad legs on the left. Her exposed skin denotes a feminine sensuality while his clothed limbs deny the viewer of any voyeuristic pleasure. The gender difference also seems to manifest in use of shapes and color palettes. Brad's room proffers a boyishness in the blue walls, bedding, and pajamas, since blue has historically served as a male signifier. It contrasts with the warmer, more neutral tones seen on Jan's side. The difference in headboards is also apparent. The square hatching of Brad's implies structure and order to the man, whereas the curvature of Jan's design seems to hint at her unpredictable nature. We see this at various instances in the film, where Brad is associated with squarish order and Jan with freeform luxury. This difference is even further stressed in the film's use of split-screen technology, forcing a physical separation and juxtaposition of spaces and the viewer's comparison of them. Through these means, the film clearly establishes a heteronormative gender difference from the instant it starts. So even if the film uses masquerade to play with subversion of patriarchal gender roles, it ends up falling back into traditional stereotypes the moment Jan overlooks Brad's deception. This ambiguity of gender portrayals prompts viewers to question if sex comedies can really be deemed as progressive. Is the sexualization of females a voyeuristic practice that can be changed, or something that is inherent and ingrained in our spectatorship?